Hello, my name is Mia Hassan Somgross, and I am the director of Rene Kassan, the Jewish Voice for Human Rights. But that's just a title. What I really am is a human rights activist who passionately believes in the responsibility I have as a human being and as a Jew to ensure that everyone is able to live their lives based on key principles I hold dear to myself of equality and justice. I'm sure that like me, many of you were moved by last night's ceremony, but stood out to me amidst the stories of loss and devastation, but also of her heroism and resistance, were the repeated messages about learning the lessons of the Holocaust and ensuring that the lack of humanity and dignity that we experienced will never be experienced by others. In my eyes, it's more than a lesson. It is a legacy, the legacy of human rights, which I would like to share with you now. So very briefly about Rene Kassan, the Jewish voice for human rights. We work to promote and protect human rights here in the UK, drawing on Jewish values and Jewish experience. We believe that as Jews, we are speakers by experience, and therefore we have both the moral right, but also the moral obligation to stand up and act for others. We use a combination of campaigning and awareness raising mechanisms, and we really a bridge between the Jewish community and wider society um, addressing human rights concerns here in the UK today. But before we start, I think we also need to understand what human rights are. Human rights are a set of social norms enforced by law and underpinned by values of freedom, equality and justice. They are universal. They don't depend on social status or any other criteria. They're equality based. The only condition for claiming rights is that you're human and they're absolute. They cannot be removed without due process, namely by law. When we talk about human rights, then we talk about the relationship between a state and an individual. And up until about a thousand years ago, there were no human rights in the sense that there were no constraints on a sovereign, whether it was a king or a Caesar or a head of church, on what they could do on how or how they could treat their subjects. People did not have any entitlements by virtue of their humanity. Rather, they were basic entitlements that were granted to them by the local authority or the reigning uh, lord because of where they were or who they are. So whether they were Christian or Muslim, men or women, Englishmen or Frenchmen, aristocrats or serfs, these could be changed or abolished basically on a whim. It's only really from the 13th century onwards that the idea that all individuals were entitled to some basic rights began to take hold. The first landmark event was the introduction of the Magna Carta in 1215 a charter of rights agreed or forced by the church actually um, on King George of England, King John, apologies, of England. For the first time, a sovereign was required to respect certain rights, the rights of all free citizens to own and inherit property and to, protect it by, to be protected from excessive taxes. This, of course, didn't apply to women or to Jews. Britain arguably will say that the Magna Carta is the genesis of the idea of human rights as we know them today. The next big landmark was the American Declaration of Independence in, 1976, in 1776, which championed individual rights and the right of revolution, and only 15 years later became the underpinning principles in the American Bill of Rights protecting freedoms of religion, of speech, and assembly. These ideas became wildly held by Americans and spread internationally as well, influencing the French Revolution, at the heart of which were the three famous words, liberty, equality, fraternity. But it wasn't until the 19th century that the concept of a bigger order, meaning something on the level that exceeds the state, began to develop. The first time this appeared 
was in the field of humanitarian law. So laws um, um, that govern wartime activities with the establishment of the International Red Cross, designed to ensure protection and assistance for victims of armed conflict and war. And following World War I, at the end of eight, 1918, the League of Nations was set up in 1920 to prevent another great war by creating a system for ensuring collective security. So definitely progress to a thousand years before that, but unfortunately not enough to uh, prevent World War II and the Holocaust. Even before the introduction of the Nuremberg anti-Semitic and racist laws in 1935, there was a gradual and systematic erosion by the Nazi regime of fundamental principles, gradually evolving from restricting freedoms to restricting access to public acts of discrimination and hate and culminating with the torture and murder of six million Jews, a classic pyramid of hate. It took the enormity and gravity of the Holocaust for human, humankind to get it, the wake-up call it needed and for the beginning of the human rights ethical journey to begin. The first immediate response was in the form of the Nuremberg Trials, a series of international military tribunals from November 1945 to October 1946 for the prosecution of prominent Nazi members of the political, military, judicial and economical leadership of Nazi Germany, who planned and carried out the Holocaust and other war crimes. At the times, the trials were described as the most significant tribute power has ever paid to reason, and are where the critical principles of crimes against humanity and genocide were first introduced. And this is also where the role of some incredible Jewish human rights heroes started. Herr Schlautepat was born in 1897 in a small town in Poland near to what today is Lwów. As a young man, he was angered by social inequality. He opposed chauvinism and dreamt of a Jewish resistance based on spirit of social justice. A lot of these feelings he had were motivated very much by his experiences of discrimination, first in Poland and later on in Austria, when he, where he tried to get higher education. As a result of which, at a very young age, Lautepart moved to the UK to pursue an education in international law, leaving behind all his family, whom all but one were later, later murdered in, the, in Nazi concentration camps. Lautepart was part of the British prosecution team at the Nuremberg trials. Um, and for those who don't know, the trials had four prosecuting teams, one for each of the winning allied forces. So there was one, a French prosecuting team, an English one, an American one, and one for the Soviet Union. And Lautepart played a vital role in leading the crimes, in defining the crimes, with which the perpetrators of the Holocaust would be charged, namely crimes against humanity. What is groundbreaking about this concept, concept of crimes against humanity was for that for the first time with a legal framework, so within international law, an individual was put at the center, looking at the individual as a perpetrator, having individual responsibility for the acts they committed, so unlike my son, they couldn't say, I didn't did it, it wasn't me, it was Nazi Germany. But at the same time, it also put the victim at the center, recognizing that as an individual victim, as individuals, victims had rights that were denied and abused. Amongst those convicted of crimes against humanity were Hermann Goering, the most important surviving Nazi official and Hans Frank, who was governor general of the occupied Polish territories and oversaw four concentration camps, including Auschwitz, Majdanek, and Treblinka. It was, it was also only during the trials that Lauterpacht discovered that he had lost most of his family in the Holocaust. And I can only imagine Lauterpacht standing in court and at some point realizing 
that he was facing the man that was responsible um, for the murder of his entire family. Bartopak later served as the British judge in the International Court of Justice. Crimes against humanity has since been used in international tribunals like Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and where crimes of apartheid, rape, and sexual violence are used. Our next human rights hero is Rafael Lemkin. Rafael Lemkin was a lawyer of Polish Jewish descent who is best known for coining the word genocide. Forty-nine members of his family and almost the entirety of the Jewish community on, of his birthplace of Polish Galicia were murdered in the Holocaust. After studying in the University of Lwów, like Lautepacht, he too left Poland and spent World War II first in Sweden and later, later in the US, where he worked and dedicated his time to create a library of Nazi decrees, proclamations and ordinances relating to the deliberate policy to eliminate entire nations and people, including the Jews. Once the war was over, Lemkin was the strongest advocate for the view that the way to prevent future mass killings of individuals was to protect the group to which the individuals belong. Lemkin's idea of genocide was accepted as one of the underpinning legal principles of the court, but he was under, unable to ensure that it would be included amongst the indictments of the um, Nuremberg trials. And that was what I would call mainly for technical reasons, because the terms of reference for the trials were from September 1939, where the war started, to May 1945, where it ended, which meant that all the accumulated evidence needed in order to show intent i.e. all the decrees and proclamations that characterized the 1930s, beginning, started in the early 1930s, were not accepted. But while the concept of genocide was not used during the Nuremberg trials, Lemkin sub subsequently led the United Nations to adopt the Convention for the Prevention of Punishment of the Crime of Genocide on the 9th of December, 1948 a definition that has since been used um, to describe the genocides in Yugoslavia, Rwanda, of the Yazidis, and most recently of the Rohingyas in Burma, to name a few. And finally, our namesake, Monsieur René Kassan. He was born in 1887 to a Sephardi Jewish family in the south of France, and was able to trace his ancestors to uh, Jews who had fled the Spanish Inquisition. He first showed his commitment to human rights as a leader of France's veterans during World War I. But even before that, as a young boy, he was heavily influenced by the Dreyfus Affair and combined broader challenges of justice and equality with his particular uh, Jewish background, albeit a non-practicing one. In the 1920s and 30s, Monsieur Cassin was a French delegate of the League of Nations. And once World War II started, he felt he needed to gen join General de Gaulle's free French government in exile here in London, um, which is how he survived while 29 members of his family were murdered by the Nazis back in France. With the defeat of the Nazis, the world became aware of the horrors of the Holocaust and the idea that never again can this be allowed to happen. This is how Kassan found himself in a newly set up human rights committee, chaired, uh, International Human Rights Committee, chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, tasked with drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This declaration was the first expression of a global commitment to human dignity. For the first time, there was an attempt to draft a set of minimum standards of human dignity. It was a voluntary process to set up a system of moral accountability to a higher set of norms and institutions to those of sovereign states. And I can only imagine how you had state representatives sitting around the table after the war, trying to come in together um, to agree on a compromise, some would say, others would say 
groundbreaking set of moral values and guiding principles. The main goal of the declaration was to set out a vision of a world where inherent dignity of all members of human family is the foundation of justice and peace, treating each other in the spirit of brotherhood, an ethical vision for a good society and a better world based on social progress and better standards of life. In 1968, Kassan was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role as leading jurist of the Declaration. And while the Declaration is not legally binding, it is the mother document of all subsequent legally binding human rights convention. And it is also the most um, translated document in the world. Monsieur Kassan always maintained that the concept of human rights, his concepts of human rights emerge from the same roots as his Judaism. Human rights are an integral part of the faith and tradition of Judaism. The belief that man was created in the divine image, that the human family is one, and that every person is obliged to deal justly with every other person are basic sources of the Jewish commitment to human rights. And that is why we have taken the name of Monsieur Kassan to best represent a Jewish human rights organization. After the declaration, which was just a declaration and not legally binding, a series of international uh, um, conventions were developed, namely by the UN to begin with, and uh, from the UN Convention for the Rights of Refugees to the Rights of Children, Women, um, and, and many others. Um, most countries in the world have signed these conventions, um, but the sense is that in terms of their um, enforcement power and the political um, involvement in their impl implementation, it's not always smooth sailing. So while international conventions were being developed, Europe was still recovering from the aftermath of World War II. And there was also fear of uh, Stalin. Uh, which led to the creation under the leadership of Winston Churchill of the Council of Europe and the Charter of Human Rights, guarded by freedom and sustained by law. Churchill's vision, which came across in the European Convention on Human Rights, was realized through the medium um, of the Convention's drafter, David Maxwell Fife, a conservative former minister who was deputy chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. The 47 members of the Council of Europe, including the UK, have signed up. We tend to say that it is because of Churchill's and David Maxwell Fives' involvement that the European framework for human rights is arguably British and Jewish, and in brackets, also conservative. The treaty crucially also included a mechanism for resolving human rights claims and providing reparation for victims, the European Court for Human Rights based in Strasbourg. Move forward to 1998 and British government decided to domesticate into British law the European Convention of Human Rights. This has had several benefits. It meant that British courts could deal with human rights issues brought by individuals. So an individual didn't have to spend time and money um, going to Strasbourg, often waiting for years for their case to be discussed and a resolution achieved. And it meant that UK policy and laws had to take into account human rights ideas. As a result, for example, um, many of the regulations we have that govern um, mental health provisions or how we tackle domestic violence, including the responsibility that's put on the state and state institutions like local authorities and the police to ensure that human rights are protected um, has been um, streamlined since then. In addition to that, by being members of the European Union, in 2009, the UK also signed the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights, which basically was a document that filled the gap created 
by the fact that the European Convention for Human Rights and the Human Rights are were products of their time. So looking at the 1950s and ensuring that new areas and challenges such as maternity rights, labor rights and environmental justice were also covered. There's an, another advantage with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is that it's an evolving mechanism, which is constantly updating laws and regulations thanks to the European Court of Justice, which is not in Strasbourg, but actually in Luxembourg. So for us as British citizens, this means we have the premium package of human rights protections. If you trace back to 1940s, where as Jews and arguably human beings altogether, there were no protections. Today, we have premium packages. But with that package comes a responsibility. The Holocaust will always be remembered as one of the lowest points of humanity, where basic values that are at the core of our shared humanity were ignored and destroyed. But it's also the point from which the universal lesson of never again had emerged, and where individuals like Monsieur Kassan and Lauterpacht and Lemkin and many others helped form the first global expression of a codified set of principles that would underpin the international community's shared commitment to freedom, justice, and peace. That's a heavy legacy. For many of us, the resulting human rights framework were, has defined who we are and how we live our lives, so much so that many of us take for granted these rights and protections and sometimes close our eyes to the many abuses of these rights experienced by others in our society and abroad. It is our responsibility and privilege to continue to remember this human rights legacy, to ensure that the hate and violence which led to the Holocaust could never be repeated. Thank you. Please. You're welcome to sign up to Rene Kassan's newsletter, be informed of our events and uh, take part in taking on this legacy.